say is I will be sending out the officer grid nominations later today. You will also get the attachment of all of the platforms for all the offices. There are several highlighted, you'll see, in the, like there are two people listed in the box, or three or four, those are all the people who are running for that office. On the platforms list, I will hi I'm highlighted in red when there are multiple people running. How this is going to work, and again, this is in March, when you come to March convocation, which is election day, you are going to take a strip of paper out of the hat or the box or the bag or whatever we have for you. That is what you're going to need to vote on the Google document. You're pulling it out of the hat so it's anonymous. I will not have any idea who. It will probably just be coded P, like one, two, or P, one, two, or three. But that way, I should help ensure that people aren't stuffing the ballot box or voting several times. If you inadvertently submit twice, I will just take your latest selection, so it's time stamped for me, but you will, if you are, everybody votes for PSJ, we have two PSJ presidential candidates, everybody votes for that, you only vote for the other uh, organizations if you're a member of that organization. So I will be contacting the presidents and secretaries of all of the professional organizations, and you will, and you need to send me a currently updated roster of your membership with email addresses. And with the email addresses is how they'll get the invitation to vote. So those are the only people who get to vote in that election. You'll still use that same coded number to vote for whatever offices you're running for. In the event there is a blank space in this, for example, there is not anybody running for, well, actually any office in ASCP. What you need to do, so after, if say, SNAPA has three people running and we have two vacant offices. The SNAPA officers, newly elected officers, get together with their advisors, so myself and Ms. Condi, and we, they decide who they would like to um, nominate and appoint to those positions. So that's how that works. The appointments are made. You need to let me know so I make sure they're in good academic and judicial standing, and then those appointments can be made. But we won't be taking any more nominations, and we won't be holding additional elections after March. These are the people who've gone through the process, and these are the people who get to be voted on. If they're running unopposed, one name in the box, those people by acclamation win that office. So if you have questions after I send out the slates and the officer group this afternoon, please let me know. Any questions for me? Dr. Gart. Just a couple of stricter feature um, announcements. As you know, we have stripped, we have kicked off our stricter future uh, campaign um, starting January 19th. We kicked that off. Um, Ms. Vero is in the process of printing something called a flat mohar. Um, probably heard of flat sailing, okay? People send flat sailing around the world to take pictures of flat sailing. Well, we have printed a flat mohar and a white coat. And uh, we are going to be passing those out, hopefully, at convocation next week. We had anticipated starting our tweet-a-thon and our social media uh, mouth storm this week, but in light of the weather, that got pushed behind with the printing. And so on next week, we will have uh, flat bow cards and some instructions for how you can win big money um, during a tweet-a-thon. So we're looking at $50 Amazon gift cards and Apple TV and all sorts of wonderful things with our tweet-a-thon. There'll be a two-week period that we're doing that for. The goal is to push out onto social media as much information as we can about meditation and adherence specific to the three disease states of scripture feature. So that being cardiovascular, respiratory, and diabetes. Uh, we will also have a comprehensive brochure, thanks to a lot of people in this room, of activities related to Script Your Future, including the 5K, including three different opportunities to go over to the state capitol to talk to legislators, including a number of health fairs and partnerships with the PA. Uh, those will also be communicated in the Friday Fetch. They were also communicated in the Friday Fetch on last week. There is a link to our blog with a complete listing of activities as well. So I encourage you to check those out and to get involved. Um, we need critical mass in terms of this activity um, through March, and so we're very hopeful that we can make a significant impact this year, even more significant than we have in years past. I think you're going to see some information come out from Dr. Jungle and her team about the alternative break. Uh, in an informational meeting about that. So really need to get everybody on board with Script Your Future, so please watch your email, watch social media, and get involved with us. And so um, I'm going to pick on Jake for a minute because I know that he can sing Adele now, or at least lip sync. So I'm hoping that maybe he can do something fantastic in terms of a video for Script Your Future as well. 
was kind of an inside joke with the P3 class, but it was hilarious. We now know what you did with your snow day. So um, lots of great stuff on social media. We want to get you all to use that energy for scripture, feature, and medication adherence. Is Andrew Van Dusen in the room? You want to come forward and talk about Wednesday real quick? NCPA is hosting um, a session on Wednesday at noon that I think all of you will find of interest uh, because we'll have a visitor from Fruth Pharmacy, and as we know, Fruth is a huge supporter, uh, not just of Scripture Future, but of the school of pharmacy in general. So, Andrew? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, tomorrow we're having our monthly NCPA meeting. Um, it's going to be in room 111 uh, at noon. And, you know, we have a Mr. Tim Weber, who he's a registered pharmacist, but now he's also vice president of Proof Pharmacy. Uh, so he's kind of like in charge of 26 different pharmacies. So he's going to be coming to speak. Uh, and Doc, I'm like out of breath because I was like <laughs> running over here from parking. <laughs> but uh, also, uh, Dr. Gardner provided us uh, with money, so we're going to have food there too. So if you're hungry tomorrow and you want to come, and hear him speak, then you're more than welcome. Thanks. Any other announcements that we forgot before we dig into legislation? Going once, going twice. Okay, so we're going to move on and switch microphones. Give me just a second. So I can wander. Okay. Uh, so, we are talking about, this morning, the legislative landscape, and so uh, I'm going to do the first part of the presentation, followed by Dr. Lucas, right, who will talk about state legislation. So, just to let you know some of the things that are happening in terms of legislation that's being introduced, but also some things that are being discussed about possible legislation that may be introduced, um, because we know that the session just started, and so anything goes over there, right? And uh, then Dr. Knight's going to come up and talk about the federal landscape. And so you'll have an idea of some of the things that are going on on Capitol Hill right now, which is very important for you to know because we're going to talk a little bit about the rider status. Uh, but I'm charged with kind of, I guess, it's the Civics 101 or Political Science 101 um, with you this morning. So that's really my job for my career. But just to give you an idea of our objective and where we will be taking you this morning, we want you to understand what your role is going to be um, with Pharmacy State and the legislature. So most of you hopefully have signed up by now for February 22nd. On February 16th at the leadership luncheon, we'll be talking in more detail with those of you who have signed up regarding logistics for that day. One of the things I do want to let everyone know up front, and I'm surprised it's actually taken the state of West Virginia this long to make this happen, but there are now increased security measures over at the state capitol. So you will have to go through metal detectors. And so what I told my advocacy class on last evening was um, the big Michael Kors, Prada, all those fancy bags that just look fabulous that I love, probably not the bag to take with you if you're going over for any of the legislative events related to pharmacy state, the legislature, or script or future, because you are going to have to go through a process now to get into the Capitol, which is brand new. Um, so the 501L class who was there in August, we can just kind of walk in and go wherever we want, and, and that's not the case anymore. Um, so we'll talk a lot more about that on the 16th, but the big piece of pharmacy state, the legislature, is to have an understanding of the landscape at the state level, and that's what Dr. Lucas is going to help you with. I do want you to understand um, the process of bill introductions. We're going to do a little schoolhouse rock this morning, okay, just to refresh your memories about how a bill becomes a law. And then we'll talk more specifically about how that works at the state level because that's where you're, you're going to be um, in a few weeks. And then we want you to be able to understand issues related to pharmacy and pharmacy practice as well as public health, okay, because as healthcare professionals, we serve the public, and public health is really important to us. So we need to make sure that we're talking about those issues as well, especially those who are likely to be introduced, or discussed, or reintroduced during this session. And then we want you to really have um, just a basic understanding of some of the things that are happening on Capitol Hill and how they may impact patient care and pharmacy practice. Okay, so you're educated about that. We do have two people in the ring who will be in Washington, D.C. on Capitol Hill next week, correct? Brian Hancock and Cassie Painter. 
will be there next week. Um, and we've had several people in the room who've had the opportunity to go in the past. And so you may have an opportunity at some point this year or in the future to go to Capitol Hill. You may also have a chance to run into a state senator. I know some of our students did during Thanksgiving. When they served Thanksgiving dinner, they did so with Senator Manchin. So you never know. You might run into somebody of influence and have to talk about these issues. And then we want you to identify ways that you can advocate for legislation that impacts the pharmacy profession and patient care. So those are our, our objectives for today. So in trying to find a comprehensive chart that talked about how a bill becomes a law, I came across stuff like this, right? And it started to me to look like a therapy class or immunology, and I was like, okay, that's too much. We just can't go there. Uh, so I don't expect you to know this slide. I just put it up here to demonstrate that if you're looking for a quick and dirty example of how a bill becomes a law, you get something that looks a little bit like a monopoly game, or the game sorry, okay? You get all these colors and you kind of if this, then that kind of thing. And so I said, forget that. We're going to try a different route. So I promised you some schoolhouse rock. We're going to spend about three minutes on some schoolhouse rock this morning. And then I'm going to break it down for you a little bit more, okay? So we can pause for station identification. <coughs> Mr. Myers and this rocket here.
That is where one of the checkpoints is, so we're trying to drop you at the door closest to that. Talk to you about security measures. You are going to be on legislative teams with students from Marshall as well as WVU. Some of you are going to be leaders of those teams. Our hope is that by the end of next week, you know who you're on legislative teams with so that you can start that process of reaching out and talking to the representative that you're assigned to. We are also going to work for a number of students who are involved in advocacy who are going to help um, to work to put together an advocacy and action table. Um, Cassie Painter is designing a postcard that you can sign and send to your representative ahead of time. Um, so that will be important. And we're going to have a scripture future message on that. So again, I mentioned the legislative luncheon February 16th. Um, for all those who are going to be attending Pharmacist Day at the legislature, you should plan to attend that. So the legislative process. A bill starts just like Bill said in Schoolhouse Rock. It starts as an idea, okay? And usually what happens is that might come from a private citizen, that might come from a corporation or a special interest group, okay? The bill is typically numbered um, based upon um, where it's first being introduced. So if it's, it's coming out of the Senate, it's going to be a Senate bill. It's coming out of the House, then it's going to be labeled a House bill. So um, we will probably not have time to show you this morning, but for those of you going to the leadership luncheon, we're going to just show you how to track bill status. So it's important for you to know that it has an S in front of it, that it's coming out of the Senate, or it originated rather from the Senate. Uh, if it's got an HB, it's a House bill. Um, so when the bill is formally introduced on the floor of the chamber, the bill number and the committee uh, references are announced at that time. And you can track those based upon the subject and bill number on the state legislative page. Um, if you are not coming to the luncheon at noon, find somebody who is in Pharmacy uh, 549 because they were all talked to how to do that last week. So they can show you as well. The bills go through the Office of Legislative Services and Legislative Staff Council to assure that they're in proper form, which means it's all the legalese there. So when you pull up the language for these bills, you really kind of have to scroll down to the second or the third page sometimes to really have to cut to the chase and cut through uh, the legalese. Um, and then there's introduction. Um, so prior to introduction, the clerk will identify each bill with a separate number. Um, in West Virginia, they're usually numbered um, as they're introduced. So the first bill that's introduced in the session becomes one, two, and then so on. Okay? So that's important for you to know. So after it's numbered, the President of the Senate or the Speaker of the House assigns the bill to committee. So just like the bill waiting outside the committee room, it goes to committee. And it can die in committee. Um, it can also be waiting to come for things to come out of committee. You see Bill up there waiting. Uh, for the committee session to end. So standing committees are a group of senators and delegates assigned to study bills involving a particular subject. So for example, any bill that has fiscal implications in the state of West Virginia will likely go to a fiscal or a budget committee, okay, because it has those fiscal implications. Most of our bills are probably going to be in a health committee somewhere. You can pretty much bet on it uh, because they typically tend to be health-related. Um, so, since a committee only represents part of the membership of either the House or the Senate, it can only make recommendations for the bill. It cannot um, vote on, here's what's going to happen to it. It can only make recommendations that then go forward. When they have completed their work with that bill, they will file a completed committee report um, that recommends one of the following. And this is in the state of West Virginia. There are some nuances in different states. So. If the bill um, will pass in its original form or with amendments offered by the committee, or the committee may offer a substitute bill. So this is where I had told my class last night to talk about sausage making. This is where the sausage making happens, okay? Um, or the bill can be rejected or they can make no recommendation at all. Some bills do die in committee, which means that the committee did not have time to take up the issue. There is a true drop dead date, and I can't remember what it is, I don't know if you ever looked it up or not, Dr. Lucas, um, in the state of West Virginia that it has not crossed over, meaning that it hasn't gone from one side to the other, from House to Senate, or Senate to House, and it did that backwards, um, that it automatically dies and cannot be dealt with in this session. In this session. So we'll look up that date for you so you all are aware. It's well after our legislative. That's about halfway through the session. 
So four actions. Once a bill is out of committee, the committee's recommendation is read on the floor of the House or the Senate. By constitutional law, it must be read three times before it can be voted on. That's in the Constitution. Okay? So it has to be read three times before it can be voted on. Okay? Once it's read three times, members will vote on the committee's amendments and Individual legislators can then propose amendments to the bill. This is where we get crazy stuff tacked on the bills, right? Um, I, my friend Mike Pushkin, who's a delegate, calls uh, the bad idea factory for that reason, okay? Because lots of people like to tack things on in this process. Once one side has voted, it can then go over to the other, okay? It's got to cross over. Both sides have to vote in order for it then to go to the government. So it's required to have action by the second chamber. So if it was voted on by the House, it will then go to the Senate and vice versa. Okay? When you do your bill tracking, you can actually see in the system, look up any bill you want, it's a free site, open to the public, you will know where it has gone and where it's at in the process. But if changes are made to the bill by the second chamber, so let's say the House votes yes, it goes over to the Senate, the Senate makes changes, guess what? It's got to go back again. So it is an arduous and long and complicated process sometimes, especially with issues that tend to be a little contentious. So we're going to send out this whole PowerPoint so you'll have access to all of this. Um, so it's important for you to know. They can also refer it to, uh, uh, back to committee if they want. So that becomes important to know. If a bill post, uh, passes both chambers in the same form it is sent to the governor, the governor has five days to approve or veto it, okay? If he has not acted in 15 days, it can become law without the signature. Okay, so that's important to know. If he vetoes it, a simple majority vote of the members in both legislative bodies, both the state and the House, can override his veto. But it's got to be a majority in both. Okay, so important to know. So monitoring legislation, for those of you who want to get in and play with this, we'll talk, I'll, I'll actually bring it up during the luncheon. I'm not going to do it here because we're really time pressed to get you, want to get you to the meat of talking about the legislation. This is the site that you go to to build track. You can build track in a number of different ways. You can do it by subject, so you can type in prescription. You can search by health-related issues. Okay. You can search by who introduced the bill. So there's a number of ways to search, and I'll show you all that. But you can see who sponsors it, what committee it's been assigned to, where it is, etc. So I encourage you to do that, to play with that. So you, and you can do that at the federal level as well. But I'm showing you state today, okay? Because that's, that's what's coming up closer. So that's basically, in a nutshell, how a bill becomes a law in West Virginia. Right? And it's good that you have at least a fundamental understanding of that before you go to Legislative Day on February 22nd. Okay? So it's got to go to both sides and be approved in the same form on both sides. The governor has a certain period of time to sign it. If he doesn't sign it, it becomes law. If he vetoes it, majority of House and Senate can overrule it. But most of the time, bills spend the majority of their time in committee. So you're going to see when you do that bill tracking all the different committees they go to. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Lucas. Okay, so Dr. Gardner went over kind of how this happens. So I'm going to tell you about some of the issues that most affect pharmacy as a profession. A few others that are kind of generally medical related that I think have some impact on us. And I want you to know this is by no means comprehensive. By default, if a bill did not pass the 2015 session, it gets reintroduced during 2016. Sometimes they get traction and sometimes they don't. So I'm including those that I feel most have impact or, or had a lot of uh, traction last year. With it being so early in the session this year, it's really hard for us to know because so many have just been introduced at the very beginning of the session and then assigned the committee. They may or may not get on the agenda of that committee. So that, that's where the chair of the committee is such an important key person. And if you all, um, when you get your assignments for legislative day, 
If you look at which representatives you are responsible, senators or representatives you're responsible for, look to see if they are the chair of the committee. That can be very important because they can help determine um, basically the traction that the, the different issues get during the session. At the state level, there's a huge, huge interest in the walk Senate. You all remember when the president came here at the end of last year. Um, this is certainly a, a huge issue. And as you all in the room, I'm sure know about the law Senator Narcan um, being an opioid antagonist, uh, reversing the effects of prescription opioids as well as heroin. And um, generally, this is administered by injection or it can be through a nasal spray. And it doesn't cause harm if someone receives it and did not need it. So that's an important piece if you think about over the counter legislation. What's one of the things that we think about when drugs are uh, approved for over the counter status? It's what kind of harm can be done if someone gets it that didn't need it, right? And how, how well, how, I guess not so well, could this be used, right? So the fact that it doesn't cause harm if someone received it and did not need it. So in general, reducing the time between the onset of an opioid overdose and the, um, getting that person to an effective intervention so that they can survive an opioid overdose. So the issue is basically who should have access to this? The, the general tense, the, the thought is that we need to try to expand access so that we do have fewer opioid overdoses in our area nationwide as well. So I, I call this behind the counter, it's not technically behind the counter, but for all practical purposes, it would be kind of like pharmacists getting to, under a protocol, determine if someone comes seeking um, naloxone for someone who would be at risk of an opioid overdose, that the pharmacist could then decide that they're going to give it to that person without a prescription. So this is House Bill 4035, and it permits pharmacists to furnish naloxone for, for those who are near, or perhaps themselves, may be at risk for an opioid overdose. So specific important information about this is that it would be under protocol, so we would have to, as pharmacists, prescribe to the protocol, agree to the certain mandates which are not yet set, that would need to be set out through the rulemaking process, there would be a mandatory consultation. So you know how when you're in a pharmacy and they sign away your rights to consult with the pharmacist? They would not have that right to refuse consultation. Consultation should include, um, among other things, the education on treatment programs. So the big goal is to get this person uh, resolved with the underlying issue. There would, of course, be retraining requirements for pharmacists. And there's a requirement to communicate with the primary care provider, someone who would be prescribing, for example, opioids for that person. This would be regulated by both the Board of Pharmacy as well as the Board of Medicine. Further expansion of access, there are a couple of bills, one for police officers, Hospital 2009, and then for school nurses. This is a Senate Bill 42. There's another issue related to opioid overdose, and that's regarding reporting. This House Bill 4183 would mandate that emergency medical service personnel who respond to or take care of a person who has um, a, a near overdose or an opioid um, problem whenever they respond, that they are then required to notify the Board of Pharmacy, who then puts that information into the Controlled Substance Monitoring Program. And you all probably in pharmacies have seen pharmacists access the CSMP. And we know that physicians also have access to the CSMP. What this piece of legislation would do is require that pharmacists continually monitor before dispensing an opioid for any reports of opioid um, overdose reporting from EMS and to identify, if it's identified, to notify the primary care provider who prescribed the opioid. One important piece that I know with this is that a lot of the burden here lies on the Board of Pharmacy as well as pharmacists. Knowing that physicians also have access to CSFD, I'd like to see some shared responsibility in that. So that's just one dog and that's my personal opinion on that. Um, but I think overall this is something that we need to look at as a health, uh, public health issue and a way that we can make sure that we're communicating with other entities 
that um, are helping to address this problem. Well, this next one is pretty straightforward. Only pharmacists can practice pharmacy. In 2013, when we updated the Pharmacy Practice Act, this little tidbit got um, eliminated. And it was originally in the old, old, old Pharmacy Practice Act in the 1930s. But it makes a criminal, if there's a criminal uh, penalty for anyone who tries to practice or provide pharmacist care who is not a pharmacist. So this one I don't think will be contested. Regulation of PBMs, pharmacy benefit managers, uh, West Virginia Pharmacists Association, who does have a lobbyist at the Capitol, um, they typically have a lot of interest in financial um, reimbursement. They represent a lot of community pharmacies and uh, retail pharmacies, especially. So, regulation of pharmacy benefit managers is an issue that they have been following very closely. Um, this would address pharmacy audits, um, try to improve transparency in maximum allowable. Um, cost pricing for pharmacies, some of the issues that they're experiencing, pharmacies are experiencing now that this legislation would attempt to uh, help with include the reimbursements that are set by the PBMs to at least cover the cost of a drug that the pharmacy experiences. Um, other things which I know that I've heard patients and customers to complain about is basically being forced into mail order and um, being encouraged to switch medication, thinking when they're doing fine on one drug, they're forced because of financial benefit to their PDM to change medication. So it would um, kind of address some of those issues. Other pharmacy-related bills, I think that uh, it would impact all of us if all healthcare providers or all healthcare workers would um, be required to receive an influenza vaccination. Right now, this is at the employer level. Um, but this would Im impact all healthcare workers to be required to get an annual influenza vaccination by October 1st of each year. House Bill 4185 establishes a ratio of uh, no more than four pharmacy technicians to every one on duty pharmacist. Right now, there's not such a ratio in our Pharmacy Practice Act, and it was addressed at the time of the uh, revamp in 2013, but it was not put in uh, purposely, so there's now an attempt to max to do the cap of how many um, technicians could work with any one pharmacist, so that basically you don't have ten or more technicians for some costs. I guess we have technicians or more per one pharmacist. And then House Bill 2454 is a carryover from 2015. This is something that we have adamantly supported in the past. Um, there is some hesitance to reopen the, Med the Medical Professional Liability Act in PLA. This uh, sets liability limitations on uh, healthcare providers, and it specifically names healthcare providers, um, but it doesn't mean pharmacists. So many other health professionals are included, but pharmacists are not. This is one way in which we're hoping to get some state level recognition as providers, but because it does um, sufficiently put a cap on liability that the physicians and other health workers are uh, very happy with, they don't want this piece of legislation to open. So I'm not sure that we'll get much traction with this this year, but um, understanding that if a piece of legislation opens, things can be added and things can be taken away. So this was a hot issue between insurance, uh, insurance industry and the medical field whenever it was passed. Other health-related bills, there are um, bills both in the House and the Senate that would expand the scope of prescriptive authority of advanced practice nurses um, and certified nurse midwives. This is important because currently there is a requirement for a collaborative agreement between these advanced nurses and, and midwives and physicians. This legislation would take away that requirement for a collaboration collaborative agreement and it likewise would allow for year-long um, prescription of controlled substances, whereas now it's only about 72 hours, so short term for many controlled substances, now it would allow for a year supply of controlled substances for advanced nurses. So this is very expansive as far as scope of practice, and today there has been some opposition from uh, physician groups. I'm not aware that there has been a stance from pharmacists in general. If we don't have an opinion one way or the other, it's better to keep our mouths shut and not um, get into what could be a turf issue. Um, so as pharmacists, that's something to just kind of mull over and think about. 
Cinnabil 320 permits practice of telemedicine in the state of West Virginia. We do have telepharmacy included in our pharmacy practice act, so we're already at speed with this in our pharmacy practice. House Bill 2924 directs the Health Authority to establish a council to investigate and to recommend to the authority pricing guides for pharmaceuticals that would exclude advertising costs. This is a carryover, basically trying to get the price of drugs down and to not pass on advertising costs to uh, the end user or the patient. This is something that Don Purdue, the only pharmacist that we have right now in the legislature, um, is in support of. So I thought it was worth mentioning. I'm not sure it's going to get traction, but I thought it was worth mentioning. The last thing I'll talk to you about before I turn it over to Dr. Knight is regarding the restructure of our boards, such as the Board of Pharmacy. Last year in 2015, there was a piece of legislation that got a little traction that basically proposed an umbrella board for multiple health professions to fall under. And I say health professions rather loosely because it included things like not only pharmacy, dentistry, medicine, but also things like the massage therapist board. So all under one umbrella, only for disciplinary purposes. So for example, we would have still had a board of pharmacy that sets our rules and, and, and re-license, you know, licensure issues and so forth. But for disciplinary actions, this one overarching board would have addressed multiple professions. Um, so that one, I haven't seen that it's really picked up this year. However, there's another issue that is very hot right now, and I do think it's going somewhere. Um, and it comes out of the House Government Organization Committee, and this is hot 2016 right now. And it's calling for a restructure of all of the licensure boards in West Virginia. Not just health profession boards, we're talking about realty boards, uh, inspectors, uh, finance, you know, all different types of professionals that have a licensing board. And this comes from a case in, in North Carolina where actually the dental board there made a ruling that People who were selling these teeth whitening kits, you've seen like the kiosks in the malls maybe, where tooth whitening is offered, kind of a fly by, you know, you're wall by, oh, that's a good idea to get my tooth whitening. So the dental board in North Carolina sent out a cease and desist order. They said that is practicing dentistry and that may not be done. So what they, they did is um, they, they stopped all of the tooth whitening in the mall types of things, and the Federal Trade Commission deemed that to be an antitrust issue and said they actually started looking at the Board of Dentistry's composition. And if we look at the Board of Dentistry in North Carolina, it was composed of six licensed dentists, one licensed hygienist, and one layperson. They were all voted on by licensed dentists in the state. And the hygienist and the layperson had practically no voting power on the board. So, that is very different if we look at our Board of Pharmacy composition in West Virginia. Our board is solely govern, governor appointed. It is not elected, even though, for example, in North Carolina, the pharmacy board um, members are elected by pharmacists. Here in West Virginia, it is a gov they are all government, governor appointed with consent and approval by the um, Senate um, to have the, the people who are on the Board of Pharmacy. We have five licensed pharmacists and we have two lay persons. They all have equal voting power. So that's our current compos composition of our Board of Pharmacy. Just yesterday, there were at least four boards, such as engineers, realtors, I believe it was, um, that got their meeting um, in which, and apparently there was no dispute, over redesigning their boards to consist with a majority of laypersons who are not licensed in their field. So this government organization committee, based on a Supreme Court ruling between, uh, with the dispute between the Dental Board of North Carolina and the Federal Trade Commission, the ruling was in favor of the Federal Trade Commission, and it basically uh, created a push for restructuring boards such that they would consist of a majority of laypersons with some representation from licensed professionals within each profession. 
So that's a major change. Apparently, each licensing board, which there are at least 30 or more in West Virginia, will at some point have a meeting with government organization to discuss the potential for destruction. So I think this is an issue we need to look at. I'm not going to tell you it's something we need to go with a major campaign at um, pharmacists and the legislature, but we certainly need to follow this issue and look at any potential implications on a redesign of the pharmacy board in the future. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Murray for national issues.
the eligibility for health care programs through key sections of the Social Security Act, and a lot of the private insurance groups and state groups follow what Medicare and Medicaid do. So because we're not currently recognized as health care providers within the Social Security Act, uh, we are not able to achieve proper compensation. And ultimately being recognized in the Social Security Act as a health care provider would allow pharmacists to bill Medicare Part B for services that are within their state scope of practice. So that's a mini elevator speech on the issue, which I'll talk about ele elevator speeches at the end. So I want to talk about the bills which you should know are related to provider status. There's a bill in the House of Representatives 592 and also in the Senate, which is 314. These are supported by the PAPCC, which is a coalition that includes a whole alphabet soup of different organizations like APHA, ASHP, ASCP, and AACP. So these organizations support both of those bills, and the bill is specifically entitled, or specifically entitled Pharmacy and Medically Underserved Areas Enhancement Act. And it's specific to locations that are defined as medically underserved. So the majority of all counties in West Virginia are defined as medically underserved, specifically 43 out of 55. And within these counties, there's nearly 400,000 Medicare beneficiaries that could benefit from us improving or improving access and the quality of health care. So the primary objectives of these bill of these bills are to obtain Medicare Part B coverage of pharmacy services by amending the Social Security Act, defining the payment of, of pharmacy services, and it ranges anywhere from 80 to 85 percent of what physicians would charge on their fee schedule, but also developing pharmacist-specific codes under the physician fee schedule. So Dr. Gardner already talked about how a bill becomes a law, so now I'll give you an update of where our bills on provider status are floating around right now. So the House of Representatives has 435 representatives in there, and right now we have 262 total co-sponsors of the bill, which is really good because that's the majority. So on the, on the top left is Alex Mooney, who's West Virginia District 2 representative, and then Evan Jenkins, which is the District 3. So these two men are among our co-sponsors. And who you don't see is David McKinley, so he's the District 1 representative. This is somebody who has not co-sponsored the bill and somebody that we could potentially reach out to. Now in the Senate, for Senate Bill 314, there are 41 total co-sponsors. To get the majority, we would need 51. So we're close, but not quite there yet. Senator Shelley Capito has co-sponsored the bill. However, Senator Manchin, which those of you who, with, who were with me for that Thanksgiving dinner, that's who we met there, he is not currently a co-sponsor, so apparently we need to do a little bit more work. Uh, but we are close to the majority in this house. Now, I have the websites listed on the slides for how you can stay updated on the progress of these two bills. Okay, so since it's a new year, I thought it was appropriate to provide an update of what happened in 2015 with our progress. So Pharmacists Provide Care is APHA's campaign for pharmacist recognition as healthcare providers, and they did send out an update earlier this month, and they stated that this has been the largest grassroots advocacy effort in their 163-year history, so that's quite impressive. There were over 21,000 supporters who sent over 36,000 letters to Congress, some of those which include the letters that you sent, and also a lot of video testimonials of patient care stories. So on the state level, there were 95 bills, which is three times more than what happened in 2014, that were introduced to address patient access to pharmacist care. 16 of them looked at designating pharmacists as providers on the state level, 24 of them looked at payments for services, and 55 of them address the scope of practice issues, which includes collaborative practice agreements. Now, regarding implications at the state level, regardless of when we get federal recognition as healthcare providers, nothing can change unless it's accepted within your state scope of practice. So luckily, West Virginia is in a really good place with our scope of practice, thanks to some of the faculty members here at UC. So our scope of practice is very broad, allowing us to perform as healthcare providers. So we really are in the best position to obtain compensation when we do gain provider status on the federal level. And there are a lot of states that are going to need to catch up. Now, 
Okay. So there is one other initiative that I will quickly go over. Um, it has a little bit of a different approach to expanding pharmacy services. And this initiative, um, which is the CMM initiative, or Comprehensive Medication Management, is supported by ACCP and CPNP, which is the College of Psychiatric and Neurologic Pharmacists. And they chose not to focus so much on recognizing pharmacists as providers, but placing more emphasis on the actual service that is provided. And they designated that service as CMM. And this is a standard of care that ensures each patient's medications are individually assessed for safety and efficacy. And it already is a standard of care in a lot of different healthcare delivery models. So with this bill, they would propose to amend Medicare Part B, Part B versus changing the Social Security Act to cover CMM provided by qualified clinical pharmacists. And qualified clinical pharmacist is really going to be defined as anybody who's board eligible or board certified in their area of specialty. So I just wanted you to be aware that there are some other initiatives going on to help pharmacists expand their services. As an update, I believe they've submitted a congressional issue brief for this, but it has not officially reached bill status. So in the interest of time, I probably shouldn't spend too much on this, but these are some other issues on the federal advocacy level that do impact pharmacists. So I encourage you to visit the link at the bottom of the page. It provides a really nice summary and a more detailed account if that's what you're looking for for these specific issues. And for what you can do, um, so I just gave you a whole bunch of information, and we all did, but what can you do right now to help support these causes? So familiarize yourself with, stay updated on, and support legislation. You have a ton of advocacy resources available to you, several of which were cited in this presentation. So participating in healthcare-related events is not just a requirement for e-portfolio. It also has a lot of benefits in showing how pharmacists can expand their patient care services. And these are some of the events that Dr. Gardner has already talked about, Health Fairs, Legislative Day, Script Your Future, different organizational initiatives. Also, tell your story to anyone who's willing to listen. You can write a letter to your representative. There's also the postcard campaign that we're going to be working on soon. You can participate in blogs and commentaries. So if you follow Dr. Gardner's Friday Fetch, that's in the most recent one, she mentioned Brian Hancock who was featured in an ASHP blog on how pharmacist roles are increasing. So congratulations to him. And also P4 students can get involved by inviting legislators to visit their practice site to see what we do and how we impact patients on a regular basis. And last but not least, develop an, edit, an elevator speech for any issues that you're passionate about. And the theory behind this is you never know who you're going to be standing next to. You never know who's going to show up at your Thanksgiving dinner. So you have to have a speech that clearly and concisely conveys your message in the event that you only have 30 seconds to talk to somebody. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Gardner and for finding your voice. So we just have one more slide, and uh, let me grab this real quick. Hopefully this mic may or may not still be on, but I have a pretty big mouth, so I think you can probably hear me. Um, yeah, that's great. Uh, so I want to just talk really briefly. I know we're at we're at noon, so just bear with us for just a couple more minutes because I think this is really important, not just for those of you who are going to be on legislative day, but in case you do run into those people at Thanksgiving dinner, we're in a grocery store, or we're digging someone out of the snow. You never know if you're going to find somebody who has some influence. And so make sure that when you're talking to folks that you understand and that you convey very clearly what is your opinion versus what is the opinion of pharmacy groups, organizations, and the school of pharmacy. We as a school of pharmacy do not have formal statements on any of the issues uh, that we address today. Some of the associations that you are involved with do. Um, so if you are a member of ASHG, APHA, etc., you ought to be on their web page and have a very clear understanding of where they stand on these issues. So you have to be very clear. You know, Dr. Lucas mentioned today, that's my opinion. You have to be very clear about what your opinion is versus what is the opinion of the profession. So don't over speak on behalf of the school. I think that becomes really important or on the part of the profession. Um, so, so make sure you're aware of that. 
Effective communication skills are, are key. That includes listening. I put that in parentheses because oftentimes we're very good at talking, but we're not very good at listening. Listening to the opposition, trying to understand why it is that they oppose becomes really important then in how you respond and deliver your message. And the final piece that I would say, and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Lucas because she may just have a couple more, is that stay informed. You have a responsibility to your future patients and to the profession and to each other in terms of moving this profession forward. And you cannot do that unless you stay informed. So if you are not hooked in with the UCS or E-News Roundup that comes out on Twitter but you don't have to be on Twitter to subscribe to, I put it in the Friday Fetch every Friday, that does the work for you. You don't even have to set up Google Alerts or RSS feeds because that's capturing it all for you. On a weekly basis, that's digesting for you very, very quickly what key issues are out there. So you really need to stay informed about these things. So. The last thing I wanted to be sure you know about, um, because you do represent yourself, and then you're at legislative day, you'll be wearing a white coat, you're going to have the UC theme tag and, and logo, and, and you also represent the profession, as Dr. Gardner said. Um, like, like Dr. Gardner said, staying informed yourself and only representing your opinion is, is extremely important, but we will also have your back. We typically follow these issues very closely and they can change quickly from morning to the 11 o'clock session that there may be a completely different picture so we will try our best to follow the major issues and we typically try to put a bullet sheet together that we arm you with so when you and your team are going to visit the legislators on legislative day you have kind of like the elevator seat you have at least the bulleted information that will be so important that it isn't necessary, necessarily an opinion paper or a stance necessarily on behalf of UC, but we typically try to agree as the three schools who are representing the profession, we, we agree on certain issues and our stance on those issues. So we try to at least give you guidance on those things. And at this point in time, we really can't tell you what it will be on legislative day because things do evolve so rapidly in the Capitol. So hopefully this has been a, an informative session for you guys. I look forward to talking with some of you guys at the legislative leadership luncheon.